Chad, do we have any more? Yes. Um, Jonathan asks, what mistakes, if any, have you noticed other media make? I think early on, we all were trying to understand what exactly these protesters stood for. And I think that there was a lot of criticism at first um, of, you know, of the press in general describing all protesters as Castillo supporters, um, you know, which which was true in, in many cases, and maybe early on was um, was true, particularly true. But I think as the protests um, evolved, it really became a much larger protest about, you know, kind of uh, condemning the government as a whole, and um, you know, and and you know, against. Boluarte and not necessarily just calling for Castillo's release. I think that it it took a while for all of us as journalists to really understand what was going on here and um, you know the demands that these protesters had and and how much further it reached than just you know their you know former president. Alex Rodrigo, you see any any, any sort of different perspective on on that? No, uh, and probably the, the the mistake is uh, of uh, of, the, of some you know colleagues is is not to take you know it's here Samantha and Alex you know they 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 took the risk of going to these places to these remote areas and to travel and to suffer trying to trying to tell that story that it was complicated but it was important you know the problem with some colleagues is or, or some media is that they they prefer to stay in Lima and to tell the story from Lima. And it's very difficult really, in Lima it was really interesting to see the people from, from these remote areas to come to the, to the city and to protest in Lima. That was a good story, but it's a totally different thing to go to these areas, to these rural areas and to understand why people are demanding. Because the demands, as Samantha said, is it's not only it's not only about the president. It's not only about Castillo. It's about people that they don't have schools, they don't have uh, clean water, um, that they have like a big, big mining project near the, near their towns, but they still live uh, in in a, in a very poor conditions. And you can only tell that story if you take the time of going there. If you take the risk of going to these in these remote areas in these these roads and to try to to tell that story so the mistake is not taking that risk taking being taking that support of your company of your newspaper or agency to go to that is the biggest problem not only in peru i think that it's the biggest problem uh with the with the cri the crisis of the of the budget also it's very sometimes it's you know, can I go here now? There's no money. How much is going? The first question is how much is going to cost? It's not, do you think it's really important to go? No. The first question is how much is going to cost? So yeah, <laughs> that's a problem we are facing uh, nowadays. Thank you, Rodrigo. I, I, I think I think I saw a couple, couple more coming, Chad. Yes, we have a couple more questions. Um, Bill asks, to what extent is this a confrontation between the former Spanish governing class and the indigenous population? I think a lot of those tensions um, came to the surface, especially once, you know, I think for at, at the beginning, everyone kept mentioning, even even the president, um, you know, Zina Duarte said, you know, Puno isn't, isn't Peru, um, you know, would say things like to try to distinguish um, you know, these largely indigenous uh, communities and in, in, in the South and in other parts of the country, distinguish them from, you know, the rule following uh, people in, in Lima. And I think that a lot of, especially, you know, when I, I was there during this big protest, when people were coming from these remote regions to Lima to make these demands. And I think, you know, you you saw in in the news and um you know even just talking to people in lima this kind of these very you know frankly racist um really you know uh stereotypes kind of connecting uh you know indigenous populations in in peru to you know terrorists to vandals to you know people who who spoke spanish differently from them who you know it, it just all of that kind of comes to the surface in, in moments like this um and I, so i think that there's some deep rooted uh tensions there Uh, and I think that 
yeah, it's it's um, it's very clear, you know the as I said before, the country it's a model of the economic, it's a model of the economic progress. Uh, every everybody in Latin America talks about the Peru economy, saying that is the best example of what governments need to do, how the central bank has to 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 work in order to have a stable economy and to have a, a stability, you know, in this, it's in, incredible. All these, you know, protests erupted three months ago and there is not a big devaluation. There are some problems, economic problems that, that are like um, doing life more complicated to Peruvians, prices are getting high, but at the same time it's very stable. So how you understand why, why people protest saying that they are still super poor, that they can have a better life in their communities uh, with this economic boom. It's like, so, so it's, and this is comes the, the confrontation, the historic confrontation. If in Lima things go very well, if the economy is growing, why we still live very bad? So we, we, we want an explanation of that. And the explanation is the history of the country. You know, it's uh, things change, but for some regions, for a lot of communities, is still the same probably life that they have like a hundred years ago. Yeah, and speaking of that too, a lot of you know Peru is the world's second largest copper producer, and a lot of the mines are located in the south, uh, where these protests took place, and that was like a big kind of. Uh, a topic uh, of protesters who are demanding. They're like, there's so much wealth coming out of our region. Uh, and yeah, we visited some communities that were right kind of surrounding these mines and some of them had no electricity, no running water. Uh, and these are kind of historical things like both Sam and Rodrigo were saying, where these are populations that have felt exploited, that they have felt racism, they felt things for centuries really. And this is just kind of another nail in the coffin really for their anger, for their resentment. So it is a big factor, I would say. And it's pretty apparent uh, when you talk to any of these protesters from these uh, regions where there's large indigenous communities. Thank you guys. Um, is there one one more chat before we, before we wrap yeah. up? Yeah, there is one last question from Diana. Um, who, uh, sorry, would you say there's been a fair interest by international media outlets in documenting the human rights violations that took place during the protests? I think I, mean, I, I think everyone's definitely. Um, I think the, if there's one thing we've we've all done is to try to focus on. Um, you know, on the deaths that that have taken place, um, and to try to kind of um, you know hold the government accountable. But I think documenting them is quite difficult because you get very little information from the authorities. Um, you know, Alex mentioned you know some documentation he was able to get, and I think some of us on the ground are able to do interviews and do some you know reporting and try to understand exactly what happened. But you know, there've been so many of them; dozens of people have died. It's so unclear what the circumstances were in many cases, and I think you know there are now human rights researchers on you know that have been on the ground and who have been you know um, you know releasing more information in more detail, and and I think a lot of actually a lot of the local press. Um, in particular, like Ojo Público did, has done a really good job of, of documenting some of these, um, you know, human rights violations, but it's it's quite difficult to, to understand exactly what, you know, has gone on with each of these deaths. Yeah, I would agree. I would say the interest is definitely there, uh, and it is, it is complicated. That's something uh, we tried to do, and hopefully successfully at points, um, but yeah, like Sam said, it's quite... There's a lot of roadblocks, both at literal and also within the government and within security organizations, the police, uh, the military, to actually concretely document uh, something of that nature. But the interest is there, I would say. Yeah, and I think that in this case, there is not like a, I don't think that there is like a, a, a particular agenda of 
uh, of the US or the State Department or the media to do something to tell one part of the story in Peru. I don't think that there is pressure to do that. I think that the, the, the journalists in Peru, uh, the international media work like really free and trying to understand the conflict and trying to do as much as possible. Uh, even as I said, sometimes the, it's a forgotten story because now, you know, how the media works now is Ukraine, the anniversary, and then tomorrow is something else and something else. And then uh, we forgot about Peru until something really bad happened again. And then we are, uh, but I, I think at this because of the, yeah, how the media work in, in general, but I think that the international media uh, he did a, a good job trying to understand the complexity of, of, uh, of the conflict. I think that there is nothing, there is not, uh, there is not a big interest in, 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 in telling, uh, you know, in telling a bad story or trying to convince people to think in one side or other side. I think that our colleagues are trying to do a, a good job in the ground. Brilliant, well look, um, Rodrigo and Alex Manta, I think that covers you know, a, a huge amount of ground. Um, as you all say, you know, the, um, we, we've covered in depth the, the sort of heat of the Peru story now is the, the uncertainty in what happens next, which will rumble on for a while. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we will be able to keep some attention on Peru going forward uh, as they try and find their, find their path. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you, uh, the three panelists, um, for sharing their experience. Um, thank you to everyone who's dialed in and listened and, and, and asked questions, um, probing uh, uh, you know, the, the experience that our reporters have had on the, on the ground. Um, so thank you all very much. And uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, join again soon for a, a next topic. Anyway, Rodrigo, Samantha, and Alex, thank you so much. Thanks thank so you. Thank you. Cheers, guys.